お願いいたしますどうぞ皆様拍手でお願いいたします Thank you start this So my name is Arnar、uh, I work on the Google Identity Team Uh, the Google, I'm also a,、uh, uh, one of the, I'm one of the、uh, participants on the FIDO Technical Working Group. There we go. Excuse me. So,、uh, I said my name is Arnar. I work on the Google Identity Team.、Uh, I'm also one of the contributors to the, the FIDO technical working groups around U2F standard and uh, the, the uh, FIDO2 standards we'll talk about. And、uh, as well as the W3C web authoring standards. I want to talk a little bit about how uh, we uh, use、um, FIDO and web authoring at Google to improve account security. So it's no secret, and we, this is sort of, we've seen this before today, and we'll probably see it again in the other talks that passwords are not really cutting it、uh, today. They don't provide necessarily the, the level of security that we need. And, From 2015, the two most popular passwords,、uh, by looking at data dumps of passwords、uh, online, are, are these that you see here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and the word password. Now, of course, there's been a lot of discussion since 2015. People have learned that passwords should be stronger, they should、uh, use password manager,、uh, have unique passwords, etc. So, of course, things have improved. So, in 2018, we went from、uh, To a little bit better passwords, but you get the point. So,、uh, we at Google, we uh, crawl uh, third party data leaks whenever we find them online, and we look for compromised credentials. And in one year,、uh, we found 3.3 billion credentials compromised in data leaks, which is a huge number.、Uh, we also see from this、uh, that the minimum password reuse rate is 17%, and that's just the minimum, so it's probably higher than that. Uh, we at Google, when we find accounts in such leaks that come from, from different sources, if we find that these leaks contain Google credentials or、uh, credentials of Google accounts、um, that are matching, we go ahead and we proactively secure these accounts、uh, to prevent them from takeover. But of course, sometimes that is too late. So, what are the three main sources of passwords in the world? There's, well, there's only data breaches、um, that we talked about. Uh, there is malware as well,、uh, malware that gets installed on computers and basically logs your passwords and sends them somewhere.、Uh, and then there's phishing that we've、uh, seen earlier today. And I want to focus a little bit on phishing today. So, what is the likelihood of an account getting hijacked if its password has been compromised in such a way? And compared to a normal account, which, like the password, has not been、uh, compromised, If、uh, that account is involved in a breach, then that account becomes 10 times more likely to be hijacked.、Uh, if you're a victim of malware,、uh, and then your account becomes 40 times more likely to be hijacked. However, if you are a victim of a phishing attack and you type your password into a phishing website, we have seen that that results in a 500 fold increase in the, the Probability of your account getting hijacked versus a normal account, which is uncompromised. So, even though phishing is, is maybe uh, uh, there, there's less passwords stolen via phishing than data breaches,、uh, they are more targeted because it's often online and the attacker can immediately take it and use your credentials to, to, to get into your account.、Uh, we see also that phishing is a very popular attack vector. Uh, 91% of attacks that we see、uh, do start with phishing and then go on from there. And particularly lately, what we've seen is that people are targeting businesses specifically. And sometimes this involves very in depth、uh, research. And phishing pages are sometimes exact copies of internal login pages that are only for employees. 
Uh, so it can be very deceptive. We've also seen that uh, uh, from our safe browsing data, where safe browsing is a program where Google uh, scans the web for malicious websites, is that since uh, uh, some years ago, there's, uh, a, uh, there's much more phishing websites than websites that distribute malware. And that sort of indicates that it has just become the fact that phishing is a better way and a cheaper way for attackers to, to go after accounts rather than malware. Uh, one last slide with numbers. Uh, we also note that phishing can be quite successful. It's, it's a very, uh, uh, for the attacker, it's, worry, it's, a, it's a lucrative method to use because for a well-designed phishing page, 43% uh, uh, success rate, and that is for all kinds of users, technically advanced users as well as uh, less technically literate users. Uh, and then we see that, well, out of all account compromises that we see, 76% of them involved uh, uh, somehow a weak or stolen password. Uh, so we, we, we really believe this is an important thing to, to look at. So I want to talk briefly about sort of what kind of things we do at Google to, to protect against this, and I want to focus on a couple of them. So as I mentioned before, whenever we find accounts that have been leaked uh, in third-party data leaks, we go ahead and proactively secure these accounts. Uh, we also, through the Safe Browsing Program, we warn people when they enter websites that are identified to be malicious. Uh, and that looks something like the, the, the page on the left side there. And this is only for pages that Google knows that are malicious. And sometimes, of course, it takes time for us to crawl and find these things, and sometimes it's not obvious that websites are malicious. So another aspect that's recent of uh, Google uh, Safe Browsing is that if you type, for example, your Google account password into a website that is not Google, then Chrome will notice that and it will warn you about it, say maybe this website is trying to fish your password. It could have also been that you just chose to use your Google password somewhere else, uh, which is equally bad, so, so that warning applies. The cool thing about both of these is that they work in privacy-preserving ways, uh, is that uh, this all happens in your browser. Google does not, as part of this, learn what websites you are visiting uh, in particular. Then there's uh, two-step verification, and particularly for what I want to focus on today is uh, Two things, uh, one is FIDO security keys, uh, external security keys to use to sign into your account, as well as what we call user verification. Uh, so I want to talk about these two things today. But for multi-factor in general, uh, multi-factor, if you, if, if you have a Google account or, or an account with a big uh, identity provider, they will often offer you a, a number of choices for what kind of multi-factor method you could use. And they're not all the same. Some are better than others. And uh, there's a recent research paper that, from Google that, that I encourage you to look up uh, that shows, for example, that uh, notification on your mobile phone is, uh, in, in general, more secure than, than an SMS text message, for example. Uh, however, all of these uh, are vulnerable to phishing except security keys because they are based on the FIDO standard. So why do I want to focus on FIDO and WebAuthn? is particularly because those are open standards. Uh, that means that what, I'm, what I will show you, what Google does and what Google, the APIs we offer, can be used by any website or app. This is not something that is specific to Google. Uh, this is something that you can go ahead and, and implement uh, with, with your websites or your clients' websites. Uh, we talked about FIDO earlier, uh, or heard about FIDO earlier uh, talks. Um, but I want to uh, explain a little bit what the context of uh, WebAuthn and FIDO is here. Uh, so within FIDO, we have something that we refer to as the FIDO2 protocols or the FIDO2 uh, spec, which is really a combination of two specs. One of them is called the Client to Authenticator Protocol or CTAP. That happens entirely in the FIDO alliance. And that is a spec that says how does a client like a browser talk to a hardware security key or an authenticator. And a hardware security key could be a dedicated device that you keep on your keychain. It could also be your phone. Uh, FIDO2 also says how clients can use built-in biometric sensors or user verification uh, to expose that to, to, for example, websites. 
And then uh, the W3C uh, uh, has a spec that is sort of a counterpart to this called WebAuthn. That is a spec that defines how do you, as a uh, website owner, uh, a, how do you, in the browser, in your website, talk to uh, these things, these authenticators. You do that through the WebAuthn API. So there are two immediate use cases, and I want to focus on, uh, um, you've all, all probably seen the FIDO enables things like fully passwordless sign-in, et cetera. <clears throat> I want to focus on particularly two use cases that are available right now uh, and are used uh, in Google and available in our APIs. Uh, so the first one is uh, what, what maybe some of you have. Um, who, who here uses security keys, for example, in your Google account or other keys? Hardware security keys. Okay, a few people. So uh, uh, this means that you still have to type your password, uh, but then you have to confirm that sign-in uh, with a hardware token. And uh, this will mean that you are protected against phishing. We think this is a use case which you use primarily when you bootstrap a new device, when you sign into an account for the first time on a new device. Then the second use case, uh, is actually gets rid of the password, but that's specifically for reauth. That means when you're signing into the account on a device where you have signed in before. Uh, and then we can use built-in uh, fingerprint sensors or other biometrics, for example. So the first one for security key is how, how does it work? Uh, when you're signing in, uh, a server generates a challenge and sends that uh, as part of its uh, web, web response down to your browser. And uh, JavaScript, run controlled by the server, sends that challenge uh, to the WebAuthn API in browser. Now the browser gets that call and then makes its own determination who is calling the API. The website does not to say, get to say who they are. That's something that the browser decides. And the browser then looks for local security keys, ones that are plugged in, maybe it prompts you to plug in one if you haven't already and then forwards that challenge as well as the, let's say, the domain of the website that you are, that asked for this. The security key uh, uh, usually starts blinking, uh, you tap it, and then uh, that, uh, that confirmation only works if the credential that is being signed with actually belongs to the website. So already if you're being fished, it stops there. Uh, if it's the correct website, if the user approves by tapping the security key, then the security key uses its private key to uh, sign a statement that says this is approved right now for this particular challenge, and that is returned to the JavaScript in the browser through the WebAuthn API again. And uh, the website then sends that back to its home server, which has the corresponding public key on file, and uses that to verify that signature, and that means that this particular sign-in attempt was deemed good. Something we launched recently is that now you can also, if you have an Android uh, 7 or up plus, that's Android N or higher, uh, then that phone can actually act as a local security key over Bluetooth. Uh, the point of this is uh, basically we have exactly the same situation before, but instead of having a dedicated hardware dongle, you can have a phone that we maybe you already have. Uh, the point is to make this more convenient because like I said, this, this does protect you against phishing. We'll see a little bit better how. Uh, and what we have seen at Google is that even given that argument, uh, it's, it's hard to get people to go and get uh, additional hardware. Uh, people don't want to carry it. It's also something, like we say, it's something you use only when you bootstrap new devices or you sign into something for the first time, so often you don't have it. Uh, but something you always have is your phone, so we believe that this makes it a lot more convenient to use security keys and get these kind of phishing protections. So um, some of you may, may know that this kind of approving of sign-ins on phones has been around for a while. And uh, that product, which for Google is called Google Prompt, and there are similar products for other identity providers, that uh, works entirely through the cloud. And I just want to point out how that second factor method is still fishable. Uh, so, so let's say I'm signing into uh, what I think is uh, google.com, but I'm actually on phishing.com, and I somehow don't realize that. Now I type in my username and password, that gets sent to whoever is running Google, uh, phishing.com, who then real time forwards that to the real google.com. The real google.com says, well, I say Arner is signing in, let me send a notification to his phone. 
and I get a notification on my phone, but since I already think that I'm signing into Google, I will say yes on that notification. That goes straight to Google through the cloud, and my confirmed uh, sign-in is confirmed, but it's actually the attacker that got it. So doing this over the FIDO security key protocols instead means that that communication between my browser that I'm using and my phone is local over Bluetooth. Uh, that means that if I'm on phishing.com, my phone actually gets to learn that locally and there's no way to do any forwarding on the back end to, to actually break that. Uh, and then one step further, uh, particularly for Pixel 3s and, and newer Pixels, uh, the, the key material is also backed by a, a Google Mate uh, secure hardware called the Titan M uh, chip. Uh, and uh, one special thing about that chip is that it's hardwired to one of the physical buttons on your device, and you have to confirm by tapping that button. That means that, for example, no software on your phone can fake that confirmation for you. So that's sort of the security keys. Like I said, this is something we think uh, can be used uh, today, and we do use it for, particularly for bootstrapping new devices. And so the first time you sign in on a new device. Uh, and this is something you can also take and implement but just by using the web and APIs. So I want to talk about the second use case, uh, and for that um, we have a persona uh, called Eliza, and uh, we're going to look at this from the sort of user's point of view. So Eliza wants to sign in her bank, uh, so she opens her bank website on her mobile browser. And, uh, and the bank is called Tree Bank uh, because we have a very talented designer who made all these mocks for us, and his name is Tree, so he named the bank after her. Uh, Eliza signs into the bank for the first time on this device by using her username and password, um, which is verified as normal. Maybe she also did some kind of two-step verification. But ultimately, when she signed in, uh, the bank website asks her, hey, do you want to, in the future, when signing in from this device, would you like to just use your fingerprint instead? Because the bank website could detect that this device has a uh, uh, fingerprint-enabled uh, sensor. And what's happening here is that there's actually a built-in FIDO security key in the device, which uses the fingerprint sensor. And the website is talking to that security key through the exact same WebAuthn APIs that we saw earlier. Um, <clears throat> so this is all, this is available in Android now. This also works on uh, Chrome, on MacBooks that have uh, Touch ID sensors, for example. So let's say Eliza says, yes, I want to do that next time I sign in. Uh, and you know, next day, she comes back to her bank. She opens the website, uh, clicks sign in. There's a cookie on the website that says, like, well, we already know this is Eliza, we just need to verify that. So the website then calls, again, the same WebAuthn API. It says, I just want to verify uh, this is actually Eliza. And then you get a system dialogue. This says, verify is you on, on this website. And the only thing you have to do is to, to scan the fingerprint or unlock the phone. Uh, that sends the same kind of assertion, exactly the same kind of assertion as we had before, back to the website, which you can then verify against the, the public key on file, uh, and you're signed in. Now, the cool thing about this on Android is that that credential that you created in a website actually also works for apps. So let's say Eliza wants to do something more, or the, the, the bank has a new app. Uh, she downloads that, and she opens the app for the first time. Um, the bank apps is like, okay, let's sign you in. What is your username? And Eliza types in her username. The bank app can then ask the system, well, is there a credential? Uh, actually, I know that on this device, Eliza does have a registered security key, uh, which is built into the device. So let, instead of just asking for a password, let me just ask for a verification of that credential. And the same system UI uh, pops up, so it verifies you. Uh, Eliza scans her fingerprint same kind of assertion is returned to the app, which then sends it back to the server where it gets verified, and then you're signed into the app. So uh, Yahoo Japan, which we'll hear from later, uh, uh, have implemented this. They already saw that, for example, just, just uh, the time to sign in uh, is reduced vastly. Uh, we see something similar on Google is that, uh, for example, when using this kind of reauth, using a fingerprint, 98% of all users finish that in less than 38 seconds. Now, 38 may seem high, but remember that's the 98th percentile. So most of them are, of course, much faster than that. So the same percentile, 98% of users, when they have to type a password, on the other hand, take uh, 150 seconds. 
Uh, so that's uh, several, time, several times longer because it's just hard to type a password on a mobile device. Another thing that we see is that uh, when we look at how do people do on these login challenges, is that when it's a password, there's a significant proportion uh, where people just type the wrong password. And it may not be like the, the, because it's the wrong person, it's just because the passwords are hard and typing them on mobile search is particularly difficult. And when we move to uh, fingerprint-based sign-in, uh, what we see is that uh, that category basically entirely disappears. Uh, which means that it's not replaced with other errors, but, but basically there's no way to incorrectly scan your fingerprint. Uh, so we believe this is also smoother, and, and not counted in those 150 seconds is the possibly uh, you know, one or two tries that you had at entering the wrong password first. So it's even more than from 38 to 150 seconds. So uh, uh, those are the, the two use cases um, that, that you can already use today. On Google, we do, uh, you can go to Google account settings. You can, uh, if you're not already in uh, two-factor authentication, you can sign up for that and then you can uh, add a security to your account. If you have an Android device, that means that you don't have to go and buy a security key, you can use the device that you have. Uh, and then we have run experiments with the, the passwordless reauth on mobile phones. But both of these things are APIs that are available. The WebAuthn API is available in Chrome on all desktop platforms as well as on uh, Android. And for Android apps, you can also, like I said, use the similar kind of API that we call the FIDO API to exercise the same credentials from, from apps. Uh, so uh, that's all I have. Passwords, again, aren't enough. They're not gonna disappear overnight. We, uh, we all have this sort of dream vision of that one day I will not have to type a password ever and I can actually just forget it. Um, but moving billions of users to that new world is, is a multi-year effort. So uh, uh, what I talked about today is something we can already do uh, and so can you. That's it, thank you. ありがとうございました。